Hello guys, uh, welcome back to my channel. It's Kasim. Um, I hope you've been having a good week. I hope the week has been treating you well. I hope your family is all right. I hope everything in your life is going as well as can be. So welcome back again to my channel, as I said. Um, I wanted to restart journal entries. And the reason why I wanted to restart journal entries is because there's a number of things that I wanted to basically share with you. There's a number of things that I wanted to talk to you about that I think um, might be able to add some value to the quality of your life. There might be some things for you to think about in your own life, some things to reflect on, some things to ponder on, that maybe might be able to help you step in the direction of your dreams, that may be able to help you uh, reach the highest capacity of what it means to be a human being as you define it to be. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do these kind of hour-long um, journal entries is because you know, look, I'm sure you probably understand how YouTube works by now in that YouTube essentially works in that most people tend to click on the clickbait on the videos that are about five or ten minutes, right? Um, but there, I think that there are some things that are so complex and are so difficult that a ten minute video can't really do them justice. Um, and there are ideas that I want to articulate to you and there are metaphors that I want to share with you and I just don't think, I, I found it really difficult to essentially articulate some of these ideas in a 10 minute video. So I wanted to use this hour to be able to share, still share with you some of the uh, journal entries and the things that I've been thinking about. Um, and, and you know what my philosophy is, you know, I share with you guys, of the reason why I started journal entries. I hold the philosophy that essentially, look, not everybody's going to be able to become rich. Not everybody's going to be able to become successful. Not everybody's going to be uh, going to be able to have positions of influence, positions of power. But every single person on this planet has had is has an amazing advantage in that we have lessons that we've learned. We have insights. We have knowledge. We have skills that we've acquired. And what I believe is, even though we may not be super wealthy, a politician, a CEO, we may not be millionaires and billionaires, we can still take all the resources in terms of our knowledge, our skills, our experience, and impart, on, um, impart it onto the next generation so that they can actually uh, have a, a head start, so that they can live an even abundant life than we did. You guys know the philosophy that I hold. One of the philosophies that I hold is that your children need to do better than you, right? If your kids do worse than you, then as a parent, you should be questioning, where did I go wrong? Because, you know, if you are uh, a parent and you only earn 20K, if your child earns 10K, then there is a problem, right? Because the world isn't going backwards. The world, the world is actually going, is constantly going forward and constantly moving. Most of you know that we live in this era that uh, the late Peter Drucker called the era of the three C's, which is accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. Guys, the world is not slowing down. The world is becoming even more complex than ever before. So as people, as leaders, as fathers, as brothers, as sisters, as cousins, um, as members of our community... We want to ensure that we are equipped, that we are operating at our full capacity so that we can help the next generation go to lengths that even we couldn't dream of. I mean, isn't that really the dream of every parent? For their child to reach accolades that they couldn't even ever imagine. You know, sometimes I think about David Beckham and I think, imagine David Beckham's parents. When David Beckham's were, were, were parents were raising him and he was three and five and six and seven, did they ever imagine that David Beckham could be able, be able to reach the echelons that he's managed to do? He's got a football uh, career that's flourished and has been absolutely successful. He's got influence in all kinds of areas. He's won uh, a knighthood, I believe, or an MBA, MBA, MB, MBE, um, uh, by uh, from Buckingham Palace, he uh, is uh, got amassed a huge amount of followers on social media. He's got a great income. He's got a wife. He's got children behind him, right? Like, can you imagine, right? That he's now got to the point where he's he's got underwear. He's got a clothing brand. Um, he does brand deals. He uh, just started a football um, academy, a football. Uh, 
uh, yeah, football academy, I believe. And you just think about that, and you just think, how in the world could David Beckham's parents ever have predicted that these are the kind of echelons that David Beckham would ever be able to reach? And the reality is, they wouldn't, right? But David Beckham's parents did the best that they could with what they had to set him up so that he could be able to achieve an incredible kind of life. I'm saying this to you guys, and you may be wondering, like Kasim, obviously people should do that. I don't think people do that. I don't think that many of us are what I call generational thinkers. Many of us don't think in terms of the next generation, right? In fact, I was actually thinking about this. This isn't what I want to talk to you about in my journal entries, but I was thinking about the fact that if you look throughout all of history, essentially every single generation has been working and making sacrifices so that the next generation could be better off than the, than the, pre, than the generation that's just been. But we're living in a time today where actually there is a generation of people who are no longer thinking about the future, who are no longer thinking about the next generation right who we're not setting our lives up as people so that our children have an inheritance and it just means that our children are basically going to start off from the absolute bottom like we did which is fine for some people because some people will say Cass that's uh you know I'm not I don't want to give my kids anything because I don't want them to be spoiled but I believe that that is your own philosophy to hold because I believe that we want to be able to set our kids up not with everything that they want but with the basics with the foundations right it's much easier to create a property empire when when your parents can help you buy your first investment by giving you 50 percent of the income right now that doesn't mean that they've given you everything but your parents helping you out with 50 percent of the of the deposit to buy your first flat which you're going to rent out is much easier than you having to save all of the money to be able to buy that first investment. Does that kind of make sense? So that's essentially what the, the, the philosophy that I hold on that. And I don't know whether you agree with me. I mean, obviously we can have a conversation about this. Um, comment below, I wanna hear what you think. Do you think that we're living in a generation where a lot of us are thinking about the next generation? We're planning for them, we're making sacrifices to make their life easier? I, I, I obviously wanna hear from you. Um, before I actually get further into this video, guys, if you want to help and support me um, get to a thousand subscribers by June, please can you like and subscribe to my channel. I'd absolutely appreciate it. You'd be an absolute legend. Um, okay, right. So let me actually talk about some of the things that I've been reflecting on this week. Some of, some of the things that I've been thinking about. Um, and, and I hope that they can maybe trigger something in you. I hope that maybe they can add some value to the quality of your life so that you can become a higher, fuller expression of who you're capable of becoming okay so the first thing that i've been really thinking about this week and, and it's something that has been a really a recurring theme in my life is i've been thinking about this concept of that we have to challenge our reality so the reason i've been thinking about this is because i'm sure most of you are aware there's a new matrix movie that came out and I've been talking to everybody about the Matrix movie and I've been asking people, why do you think that so many people love the Matrix movie? Why do you think that the Matrix was so revolutionary for so many people? And I think in part, based on the feedback that I'm getting from a lot of people and the reflection that I've been uh, going through myself, I think the reason why The Matrix is such an impressionable movie and was an impressionable movie for many people is because the matrix made a lot of people challenge their reality. The matrix was a metaphor for a lot of people, was the father figure, was the Mr. Miyagi to the karate kid of for a lot of people because I think a lot of people have not lived in a world and have, do not have people around them who challenge what they believe, who challenge what they believe to be the truth. I tell people all the time that the reason why I wrote my first book on conditioning is because I recognize that until you realize that you're conditioned, you can't possibly think about even ever reaching your potential. Like, How can you reach your potential if you think that your potential is, let's say, a five out of ten? When you, If you think that your potential is a five and the ceiling for you is a five, but actually your potential is a ten, 
If you have been conditioned to believe that your potential is a 5, you will never go for a 10, even if you're capable of doing it. And I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday in my workplace, and we were talking about the fact that how many people are raised... We were actually talking about private schools, and we were saying, look, if you go to a private school... Well, actually, what he was explaining to me is his cousins went to private schools, and he was talking to his cousins, and he was saying, Cass... The difference in their thinking, the difference in their uh, kind of uh, uh, reflecting and their ideologies and their approach to life is very, very, very different to his because he went to conventional state school. And I was saying to him, why do you think that is? And he said, well, when you go to, obviously, I, I, he was explaining what he thought. And he was like, Cass, if you go to a private school, obviously, you get certain tutors, you get uh, people, all these resources available to you. You get to meet people from all walks of life. And one of the things that I added to him, which I think is really important, is I was explaining to him about the fact that the original reason why, one of the original reasons, let me rephrase that, one of the original reasons why people went to university is because university challenged what you believe to be the truth. Okay, when like I, I, when when I first started off studying successful people, I was shocked when I studied people who made it to like uh, uh, MIT, Harvard, uh, who made it to Oxford. Um, and these individuals, I'll study them, and I'm listening to them talking about how they got there and what the experience was. And the amount of people who said that they they were in top sets, they were doing amazing before they went to Harvard or MIT, and the moment they got there, they became a bit depressed. Because the moment they got there, they realized, damn, I thought that I was doing well. I thought that I was clever. I thought that I had to figure it out. But now, I'm in this room, I'm in this community, at this university with a lot of people who believe things absolutely with conviction down to the point where they're willing to prepare to fight me and to protest and those opinions directly oppose my own and the issue that you then have is well you either ex open your heart out and say okay why are these people at the same university as me who all seem clever? Why are they saying these absolutely crazy things? Why are these intelligent people saying these absolutely mad statements and saying things that are completely are opposite to what I believe to be the truth? And this is where I guess the separation for a lot of people happens because I remember I was reading a book um, by a woman called Dr. Carol Drake. Dr. Carol Drake talks about this concept of a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So she believes that a fixed mindset is somebody who believes this is the way that I am, this is the way that I was born, I'm a product of my genes, I'm a product of um, my parents, and that is all my life is. So if I was born poor, I'll always be poor. If I was born with dyslexic, I'm always going to be at a disadvantage. And she said the opposite to that are people who have a growth mindset. People who have a growth mindset accept that there are certain characteristics and traits and genes that a person inherits. But they say, irrelevant of that, we can still grow as people. We can get better. We can improve, right? And the, the difference in these two approaches and these two philosophies and mindsets is that one mindset stops you from growing. One of them stops you from developing. One of them stops you from taking things to the next level, to reaching your highest capacity of what it means to be you, right? And the other one encourages you to pursue your capacity, to push right to the edges of your capacity, to see what you can do. And here's what I'm trying to say to you. There's a lot of you who are going to be listening to me. It may not be you, it may be your best friend, but there's a lot of people who are going to be listening to me and they've never challenged what they're capable of. They've never actually tried to go 100% into their capacity to see whether they can reach greatness. To see, like, a lot of, like, let me give you a challenge or something to try. Try for the next 30 days to be the absolute best human being that you can possibly be. Work as hard as you can possibly work. I'm talking about if you have the choice between giving 100% or giving 30 and no one's there, give 100% even nobody is watching you and watch what happens to the quality of your life. 
And I say this because a lot of people have never actually tried this. I say this to you. If you've never actually gone to the gym and worked out for a long sustained period of time, meaning six or seven months, try it. See what happens when you actually work out regularly and, and, and eat healthily and uh, 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 feed your mind with positive energy and positive people. Try that for eight months and see what happens to the quality of your life. That's what I talk about really pushing to the edges of your of your reach, to the edges of your uh, potential, or the edges of your of your greatness. A lot of us haven't ever reached that. A lot of us haven't ever stretched to that. But as I say, in part, because many of us have never actually challenged our reality. Many of us are living in this matrix. We're living in this zone. We're living in this bubble where we don't even realize that there is uh, things outside of what we believe to be the truth, that there are, uh, there is greatness, that there is abundance, that there is joy, right? I remember I was listening to a lady a few weeks ago, and she said something to the effect of, don't allow your experiences to cloud your uh, potential for the future. Meaning, she was exp essentially saying, because she was talking to women who had gone through uh, men who had dumped them or men who had gone through relationships where the women had cheated or betrayed him. And she was saying, look, you need to be careful that if you've had two or three different people betray you or cheat on you or lie to you or, 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 or abuse you, that you don't allow that to cloud the fact that that is a very small minority of people, right? And, and in fact, actually, one of the things that I say to people, and I'm going off topic slightly here, but stay with me. One of the things that I say to people is you have to do the maths, meaning there is a lot of people who take extreme cases, who take extreme examples, and they use the extreme examples and the extreme cases as an excuse to either not try or as an excuse to continue going down a certain route. So what I mean by this is, for example, a lot of people will say, well, Kasim, a lot of people can't be millionaires, okay? You need to be uh, born in a certain household and your parents need to be a certain whatever to be a millionaire, which is not actually true. Obviously, in order to become a millionaire, it obviously you would be an, uh, an anomaly because the majority of people are not millionaires. But what you can do is you can leverage yourself and, you, and it will. Number one, you have to accept that it's even possible that you can become a millionaire, which we know that it is because we've seen loads of people start off with nothing and become millionaires. After you fought that battle, you then have to realize, ah, okay, I could actually do this. I could be somebody. It's one thing to think that somebody else can become a millionaire. It's a very different thing to think that you could actually do it. And when you start looking at it and you start actually pushing and you start examining, oh man, I'm a, I could actually do this. I could actually achieve this. It changes your entire viewpoint. It changes the paradigm in which you live your life. And so I guess one of the first things that I want to ask you to think about, and excuse me for a second, one of the first things that I would ask you to think about and you want to question yourself on is, have you been pushing yourself? Have you really been challenging what you believe to be the truth for you? What even is your potential? Do you even know? Who told you what your potential is? Because here's what the conversation that we had earlier on with yesterday with my friend. <clears throat> if you've grown up in a household where look, people have told you that you're not enough, you never amount to anything, you'll never do anything, things are impossible, etc. You won't ever think that is actually possible. In fact, you will think that it's your normal. Um, the, 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 the formula that I say to people for what is normal is, what the formula for what is normal is what is familiar. Whatever is familiar is what is normal. Meaning, if you saw your parents as you were growing up, you saw your dad punch your mum when you were growing up, that becomes familiar. Guess what happens to a lot of men when they later on go and get married themselves? Whenever they're unhappy or they're angry, guess what they do? They punch their wife. And you say, well, how can somebody do that even though they know it's bad? Why? Because it was familiar. It feels like home. It's normal for them. And so my question to you is, what the hell is normal to you? Let me finish this off by saying this. So basically, in my first book, I give this story about these two fish. Let me tell it to you. So basically, there are these two fish, young fish, they're swimming along. 
there's an older fish swimming in the opposite direction to them. As they get closer to the older fish, the older fish says to the young fish, Good morning, boys. How is the, how is the water this morning? The young fish look at the older fish and they're a bit confused, thinking, what a weirdo. How is the water? Whatever. So they carry on swimming. He then carries on swimming in the opposite direction, whistling on, having a good time. A little while down the road, one of the fish, I know you're thinking fish don't talk, Hassan, but in this story they do. A little while down the road, one of the fish says to the one of the fish, she's the other fish, a bit like puzzled and worried and thinking deeply. So he says to him, what's wrong with you? What, what's up, mate? And the other fish says, nothing, nothing, it's, a, uh, it's nothing. He says, I know there's something wrong with you, so what's your issue? What, what, what are you thinking about? What's worrying you? And he says to his friend, what the hell is water? And the reason why I gave that story, and in fact it's the first story that I give in that book, is that if you've been born in water your entire life, how would you ever know that you're in water? The only way that you'd ever know that you're in water is if somebody came along and said to you, you're in water. And here's where it gets even more interesting. For the majority of us, if somebody comes along and tells us we're in water, do you know what we're going to? Denial. Denial, denial, denial. We'll say, well, there's no such thing as water. You're trying to attack me. How do you think? Here's where the difference happens in people's lives. There are some people who say there's no such thing as water. You're weird. But then some people say, hmm. Why would somebody ask me what is water? Number one, what even is water? This is where now you get clever and you start looking at questions like, hold on a minute. Everyone around me seems to be unhappy. Why? I'm doing the same things as they're doing and they're all unhappy. Does this mean I'm going to become like them? Hold on a minute. Everyone around me seems to be angry. Everyone around me seems to be successful and I'm unsuccessful. Why am I unsuccessful and they're successful? What is it that they're doing that I'm not doing, right? This is now where you get into self-reflection, you get into uh, introspection. And what I'm trying to say to you is, a lot of us, and it's really the point of what I've been thinking about a lot this week, a lot of us have never stopped to actually look around. Have you ever driven and you've driven somewhere and you've not actually realized how you've got to where you've driven and you were on the motorway and you left the exit, but you don't ever remember leaving the exit. And you get there and you're like, God, I, I could have died. Like, I don't even remember how I got here. And so I guess as you're listening to me today, one of the questions that I would ask you is, how did you get here? Where even are you? Where is here in your life? Are you happy? Define what happy is. What the hell does it even mean to be happy? Are you successful? Well, let's define. What even is success? Who, who said what success is? And even more, are other people influencing your definition of success without you even realizing it? You know, there's just, let me finish off with this story. I know I said I was going to finish off with a fish story, but let me finish off this, with this story. I remember I once heard this story with Jim Rohn, and he said, he was giving this uh, example to a bunch of school kids, and he was giving them this example where he said, imagine I put, you had a coffee, and I put sugar inside of your coffee, and you drank it. He said, what would happen to you? You would say, well, Kasim, the coffee would probably be a bit sugary. Then he said, what if I came along and put poison in your coffee and in or your cup of tea and you drank it? And you would probably say something on the lines of, well, Kasim, if I drank it, then I'd be dead. But here's where it gets even more interesting. He said, what if your best friend, your mum, your cousin, somebody who you love, somebody who you care for, comes along and accidentally pours poison into your coffee or your cup or your tea and you drink it you would still be dead here's my point to you there are going to be some people who are going to say things to you in your life who tell you what success is who tell you this is the best route but they could be wrong in fact one of the things that i have learned in my life and it's been really one of the major uh life lessons for me is that good people can make terrible decisions they can make terrible errors in judgment i didn't know that i thought if you're a good person then you're always going to make good decisions i found out that's not true i found out that you can make be still be a good person 
and still recommend something really bad to somebody and still make a really bad choice in your life. And what I'm trying to say to you is, maybe you have been growing up in a world where everybody's been telling you this or to do that or this is the best for you. But I'm just saying to you, they might have been wrong. And my question to you is, how do you even know that they're wrong? How do you even know that they're right? I don't know. You have to think about this stuff. You have to actually, actually like stop and reflect and examine. And I wonder whether you've done that. Have you? Have you stopped and actually began? Why is everybody just, like, ask yourself, why does everybody go to work? It's a really serious question. Why is it that people go to work? Why is it that work is in the daytime and not the nighttime? Like, you may never have even thought about some of these questions, but this is where you go to the next level of life. And in fact, on that note, one of the things that I, which is one of the things that I've been journaling about, which is the second thing that I wanted to talk to you about, is actually about the different stages of life. Because this week, I've really been thinking about how many of us in life don't understand what stage of our life we're at. See, if you've lived around this planet for more than kind of 23, 24 years, you've probably by now pretty much figured out that this people, there's people on different stages of life and there are people on different levels of life. Do you understand what I mean by that? So meaning that in your very town that you live, there are people who live in one bedroom bed sits. there are people who li are in a, live in a council estate and there are people who live in five, six, seven, eight bedroom houses in the same city that you live in. Now, we could say Kasim or village or town. Now you could say Kasim, well, they got money inherited. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there are, there are in the same time town as you, in the same country as you, there are people who have, there is that much difference in the levels and the quantities and the quality that people have in their life. Well, firstly, have you recognized that? Do you recognize that? And here's even uh, an even more important question, which is what I was thinking about for me. Where are you? Where are you on that scale? And then on the other hand of this is if, you, if you've been up around this planet for 23, 24, 25 years, you've pretty much gathered by now that there are different stages to life, right? So there is a stage when you're going through your teenage years. There's a stage which is your partying years. There's a stage when you're going through your adolescent years. There's a stage when you are, uh, you're going through your education years. But much higher than that, which, uh, before I continue, here's what I'm going to say. Those stages of life are very well defined. And I think you'll agree with me on that, right? But here's what I've recognized, uh, I've realized. A lot of people, once we leave university, we lose track of where we are at in the stages of life because the stages of life don't stop. For example, one of the things that I was talking to somebody about is I was explaining to them, listen to me, as a woman, you have to recognize that there is a stage that is optimal for you as a woman to have children. Now, you can say to me, Kasim, all about your independence and feminism and you want to have your workplace. But I was saying to her, look, you cannot defy biology that has been predestined for thousands and thousands of Darwinian years. <clears throat> we know that your body at a certain time is primed to have children before a certain time isn't ready. After a certain time, it's too late. My question to you is, if you ever plan on having children in your life do you recognize what stage of your life you're at because here's my point if you leave it if you try to have kids too early you won't be able to but if you leave it too late you also won't be able to and your job is to kind of figure out whereabouts am i and and strategically think about your life and actually begin to plan it out at, to the best of your ability so that you can make the best decisions for you now, in me saying that, obviously, number one, that means that you have to be strategic. That means you actually have to think about your life and say, hold on a minute. So if I do want kids and there is a time when it's too early and there is a time when it's going to run out, when am I going to need to prioritize stuff? Right. 
that's the first thing and a major thing. So a lot of people don't even think about that. A lot of people are just like, yeah, well, Kasim, I'll figure it out. It will just happen. I'm telling you that sometimes it doesn't happen. I was saying to somebody, that same lady, I was saying to her, okay, so you've said to me that you do not wish to have children unless you're married. On average, in order to get to the point where you're married, how long do you need to be in a relationship for most women? Ideally, most women would ideally like to know the person or be in a relationship with that person for two, three, four, five, six years before they start getting married. Now, if you're with a person for that period of time and you wish to have a child, so that means you're going to be with them for five or six years, let's say you're 30. That means if you don't find your partner until you're 30, by the time you get to the point of marriage, you're going to be 35, 36. You've got to start thinking, hold on a minute. So if I have a baby at 35, 36, and is that the prime for a woman to have her kids? Because if you, and again, this is where I talk about, you've got to be clever about this. You've got to actually think about some of this stuff. Because a woman trying to have children at 36, 37, 38 is 100% possible but it's not probable. It's really, really, really difficult. You put yourself at higher risk of miscarriages. You put your baby at higher risk of uh, uh, getting things like ADHD, etc., etc. And I don't want to get into that. But my point is, you have to try and think about this kind of stuff. Because I've met a lot of people, women in particular, who focus their attentions on their career. And then they figured out later on that, holy crap, I've left getting a child too late. I'm now 33. I still don't have a partner. I don't know where to find a partner. The partner that I'm looking for is rare and doesn't even want somebody like me because the person that I want is six foot, hands, earns 50K or above, is good looking, is a good man. Well, all of those men are already taken or if they're single would they want a woman who is in her 30s who has been focused on her career who isn't feminine because she's had to be very masculine in order to be able to get to the top of her field so now i'm in a position where i'm i feel trapped right where i feel isolated so what i'm saying to you is you've got to try and think about this kind of stuff and I recognize that a lot of us have never actually thought about this kind of stuff. We've never strategically thought about this kind of stuff. But the second thing that I, I, I think is also really important is to recognize where you are in your life. Okay? Because a lot of us, we are determining how we're doing based on how other people are doing. Which is important. It's important because... You can kind of use your grandparents, your parents, your friends to kind of use how you're doing. But here's what I've discovered. All of us are all on different journeys. We're all on a different life track because we all have different destinies. We all have different missions. But the, my point being is there are some things which are set in stone, right? But the, there are other things which are flexible and which are only unique to you because for example you might say actually Kasim I don't really want uh, to have a to have children right so for me I want to be able to focus all my time on building a business right on making it the the biggest business possible like the like Apple like Amazon and that is what I want to do I don't want to have a family in that case you then have to figure out for you based on that time scale where you are because if you are 65 and you're wanting to build a business as big as Amazon you've really got to start revaluating and thinking about this stuff now if you're 20 and you're thinking about it you may not have enough experience you may not have enough knowledge you may not have enough connections right you may not have enough resources to be able to do that so you may have to go out into the workplace get some experience understand how the corporations work understand where the gap in the market is right meet some new people find uh, how uh, find out about how logistics works how recruitment works etc so now when you're 23 24 25 you can start building your business does this kind of make sense what i mean by this right and so my point being is, as a man, as a woman, you want to begin to figure out for yourself what stage of life you're at. I have what I call the six stages of life, which are survival, security, freedom, mastery, 
pioneering in contribution and in the highest stage of life that you can go to is what I call self actualization. <coughs> Let me run through these briefly so we can I can help you with them because they may be able to add some value to the quality of your life. So the first stage of life is what I call survival. Survival is where the majority of people start off, meaning you're struggling, you're doing the best that you can. The, the key word that I give at survival is reacting. It, it, the key word is responding, meaning when you're on survival, all you can do is react. All you can do is respond. All you can do is the best that you can do. But then the level beyond that is security. When you get to security, it means that you've worked really hard, you put effort in, you've worked extra hours, you've worked uh, extra on your marriage, and now you've got a marriage. Maybe you were really terrible with women and now you've managed to get a wife, okay? And now, for what a lot of people do is they stop growing, right? And so the, the, the key word that I use here is maintenance. A lot of people, instead of growing and developing and fertilizing their relationship or their life, what they do is they try to maintain it. They try to keep it exactly like how it was in the very beginning. And we all know that any there is no such thing as maintenance. Anything which is not growing is automatically dying by default. Right, So it's actually better to grow something than try to maintain it because it is much harder to maintain something than to grow it. And the thing about life is, life is constantly wanting to grow. I mean, to the point where you look at things like trees or viruses. What does a virus do? It multiplies, it grows, it tries to expand to all of its capacities and the different, the different areas of the body as it can. Beyond that, we then now get to what I call freedom. Freedom, the key word there is risk. Because to go from security to freedom means that you have to create. Okay? Now, creating means that you have to risk something. Your money, your time, your resources. You know, there are some people who have got to a point in their marriage where they've hit a plateau. And to be able to take their marriage to the next level, they may have to maybe have kids, right? They've reached a point where they're like, man, we feel like something is missing. And it may be kids or <clears throat> it may be that they need to reconnect with who they are, with taking things to their, maybe in a relationship, they don't have a mission for their relationship. They don't have a purpose for their relationship. And in order to take their marriage to that next level, they may need to talk about some things in their marriage which they've, they've never even talked about maybe start a course or a workshop in their local community to help young people improve their marriage, but they've never actually thought about that, right? Do you understand what I mean by this? So beyond that, when you now get to mastery. Now mastery, the key word that I use there is refinement. Refinement is all about taking what you've learned, taking what you've built, and now refining it. Meaning, you may find that you have money, you have success, you have... Uh, uh, everything, but the but the thing that you, is wrong is your health isn't in line. So that means you now have to go and realign your health. You may find that you are ultra successful, but you don't have a very good social life. So now your life, your job is to <clears throat> diversify or to um, to delegate to the degree where maybe somebody is running your business full time and you work. You're, I don't know, you work part time and then you spend more time with your children, you spend more time on your hobbies, skiing, whatever it may be, uh, g b developing a social group, right? Developing friendships. Do you understand what I mean by that? From that, then you then get to the next stage, or which is called pioneering or contribution. So basically, when you get to that point in life where you have everything. Okay, I'm talking about somebody like Kevin Hart. You have money, you have a family, you have kids, you have influence, you have power, you have income, you like you literally have everything that the average person could possibly want. Security, health, everything. You have a major problem which most people don't experience in their life, which is you ask a question of what now? What the hell do you do now that you've reached everything? Now most people are not taught about this because most people don't ever reach this kind of stage in their life. So when you reach this stage, you have two options. You either go towards pioneering 
or you go towards contribution. Now, most people go towards contribution, which means you go back and you teach other people, you go back and help other people, you set up a foundation, you set up a school, something like that. You understand what I mean, a workshop. But you go back and teach other people how to reach the same level as you have. A very few amount of people take things to a whole different level, which is where they go to what's called pioneering. This is where you have people like Richard Branson, people like Michael Jackson, people like Michael Jordan, people like Usain Bolt, people like uh, um, David Beckham, who we talked about. There are a lot of footballers who they've done an amazing career. They've got loads of money. They don't need to work anymore. But David Beckham took things to a whole different level. He was the first footballer to start a football club, to then have a more uh, um, um, underwear <clears throat> branding and all of these different diversifications of his brand and, and and of himself that he's got a lot of people don't do that because you basically have to work even harder michael jackson michael jackson had made it with a jackson five but he took things to a whole different level right with a thriller album and whatever so Believe it or not, even when you get to that stage, there's another stage which takes things to an even higher level where you now have what I call self-actualization. Now, self-actualization is the highest point of life and the average person doesn't reach this. This is a stage of life where you have people like the Buddha, you have somebody like Oprah. Um, you, these are the kinds of people who you get at this kind of level. Right, because you have literally done it all. You've pioneered. You've achieved success. You've got family. You've got happiness. You've got joy. You're healthy. You are influential. You have great friends around you. You literally have everything. And the key word at uh, self-actualization is peace. Now, I didn't tell you what the key word of pioneering and con and contribution was. The key word there is fulfillment. As self-actualization, the key word is peace. What I basically say to people is, uh, uh, fulfillment, as uh, self-actualization, what you are trying to do is to put your house in order, is to gather things so that you don't have to worry. Are the kids okay? Is the house safe? Is the next generation all right? Did I complete everything that I wanted to complete? Am I happy? Have I given peace to my parents? Have, have I forgiven my parents? Have I looked after them? Do you understand what I mean by this? It's a whole different level. Now, in me explaining all this to you, I'm explaining this to you because my point to you is a lot of people don't even realize whereabouts on that scale they're at. They have no idea what stage of life they're at. They're just kind of going along. And I realize part of the reason why a lot of people want to go down that route is because a lot of people don't want expectation. The thing is, when you start looking at things like, where am I? What stage of life am I at? You now add expectation into your life. And a lot of people don't want expectation. There's a lot of people who want to be free. Freedom means, people want absolute freedom. What absolute freedom means for a lot of people is, I don't want you to judge me. I can do anything and you can't say anything to me. You can't judge me right? I can say whatever I want. I can wear whatever I want. I can go wherever I want. I can start any anything. You literally can do anything with no consequences. That what, That's what a lot of people are wanting when they want freedom. The issue is that also takes responsibility away from you because the source of manhood is responsibility. When you take on hard things and difficult things, automatically you have to have a, certain, a responsibility. You have kids, guess what? You can't just do whatever you want. You can't just go out and get par party and drink whatever you want. You have to be careful about driving because you've got kids in the car, right? When you take on a responsibility of being the boss in an organization, guess what? You can't just turn up whatever you want. You just can't call up sick whenever you want. Like there is a responsibility. There's an expectation which is uh, imbued with the responsibility and a lot of people don't want it and i say this to you because part of the reason why so many people i have discovered 
in my own life and observing other people, a lot of people are not where they want to be. They're not as successful as they are. They're not reaching greatness. They're not successful. They're not reaching their full capacity. Is in part because a lot of people want freedom. A lot of people don't want to take responsibility. A lot of people don't want to imbue themselves with um, with activities that are going to kind of constrain them to uh, operating in a certain way. People want to be uh, eagles. People want to be free birds. The issue is a society and a community cannot function when the majority of people are operating in that kind of mindset and that philosophy. And so I guess it's something for you that I would share with you, you want to think about. You may not think about it, it may not be necessary for you, but that's just what I've been thinking about and I have been reflecting on. So to, to conclude that, my question to you is, um, what stage of life are you at? Is this the building stage of your life or is this the reaping? stage of your life is this a sowing stage of your life or is this the harvesting stage of your life is this the right we've got to go a hundred percent into everything or is this we've got to put the brakes on everything question when was the last time that you prioritize in your life do you need to focus on your health at this period in your life here's what i've discovered you reap in your 30s what you sowed in your 20s. You reap in your 40s what you sowed in your 30s. You reap in your 50s what you sowed in your 40s. Meaning, guess what? If you do not, as a man particularly, let me talk to you guys because this is important. If as a man you spend your 20s partying, no focusing on a, a, a mastering a certain area, because you know what I say to you guys all the time. If you want your life to be much easier, focus on one area for 10 years or more and master it. If you haven't spent your 20s mastering one area and focusing your full attention on that one area, you're going to have nothing in your 30s. And, and this is where it gets even deeper. If you then, in, you're in your 30s at the moment and you don't focus all your, att uh, your attention at focusing in one area in your 30s, guess what you're going to have in your 40s? nothing you're still going to be average you're still going to be like everybody else aren't you which kind of in fact also now leads me to one of the other things that i was thinking about um which is that look i think it's really 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 important to take a review of how we're doing uh, how do I mean by this? Uh, so I have a, work, a goal setting workshop and in that workshop one of the things that I talk a lot about is in fact it's the first exercise in that goal. So there are six stages of the goal setting workshop. The first stage, the first step in that goal setting workshop is accountability. And essentially what it is is that you spend the first 25 minutes to 35 minutes talking about what you've learned, how you're doing, where you're at, how is your health. Rate your health out of 10. If 10 was like an Olympian and one is like somebody who is obese, who is going to need to be in a hospital and get surgery, whereabouts are you? If your capacity, if based on how you think your health could be, if we could rate your health 1 to 10, whereabouts is it? Because the reason why I say this to you is because this is what I've discovered. I've discovered that everybody wants to be an anomaly. Everybody wants the exception Everybody wants uh, uh, to have things that are 7, 8, 9 out of 10, but most people do not qualify. They themselves are not 7, 8, 9s and 10s. Does that make sense what I mean? So there's a lot of guys who think that they're 6s and 7s out of 10, therefore they want women who are 7, 8, 9s and 10, but actually, if you look at how they're actually rated, they're more like 3s and 4s out of 10. And let me tell you why I say this to you. So I was listening to a video of a woman who was on YouTube who was explaining about how a woman can grab herself and bag herself a high-value man. High-value man meaning like a footballer, uh, a guy who's earning 10K a month or more, 
but basically a high flyer. You guys know what a high value man. So somebody who is very well off, very influential, has a business, is a CEO, a partner, is doing really, really, really well financially. Okay? And this woman was explaining how a woman can grab one of these men. And she was explaining, for example, um, if you, she, she, one of the things she said is, if you want to know that you qualify for such a man, look at who approaches you on a daily basis. She said, if on your, in your day-to-day -day life, very few men who are millionaires, who are high-value men approach you, then you are not as hot as what you think you are. And she said, if you want to see how hot you are, she's, uh, th this is how clever this woman was. She, she's very clever. She said, most football teams and basketball teams, are, if they've got a big game, they arrive about two days before the big game and they book into a hotel. Okay. She said, you can find out where they're staying. It's always usually over, um, over the news. It's usually uh, over their social media, or the company's social media. You can tell where the footballers are going to stay Okay, if they've got a big game. She said, arrive on two days before uh, they uh, have their big game and go into the... Uh, what did she say? Uh book a, hot, a room in that hotel and when you know that they're supposed to be coming downstairs or supposed to be having dinner or whatever go to the reception area go and have a meal obviously be dressed well be looking your sharpest and then go to the bar and sit there and watch if any of these men approach you because i'm telling you now a bunch of guys who are footballers or basketball players if they go to have their meal and they walk past the bar and they see a, a girl who's an 8 or 9 out of 10, I'm or 10 out of 10, I'm telling you right now they're all going to be speaking to each other about it. They might be asking the concierge to find out whether if the girl's staying in the room, it, uh, where is she staying, can she come, they're going to be saying to the concierge, can you ask the girl to come up to our room, can you ask her to call us, to text us, what's her number, how old is she? The guys will do that, right? So... She said, you will be able to determine for yourself whether you even qualify for such men. Because you may think that you're an 8, 9 or 10, but in reality, none. you do not qualify for any of these men. You're actually a 4 out of 10. You're actually a 5 out of 10. So you don't qualify. Let me explain something to you. The reason why I say this to you is there's going to be a lot of you guys who think, who, who are really frustrated with the world. You want more income. You want more money. You want more women. You want a fitter woman. You want to be able to travel. You want more freedom. The issue is you're not even average. You're less than average. If you look around you, for example, um, I was looking at uh, cre my credit score. So if you go on, 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 the, uh, on credit expert, no, basically any of the credit rate agencies in the UK, you can tell what your credit rating is and then they will tell you what the average is in your town. And here's the thing. As I started to look at my credit rating, I realized, holy crap, my rating is not as good as I thought because the majority of the people in this town have like 80 points more than me, which means I'm not even average. Because if I was average, I would be above that credit rating. Do you understand what I'm saying to you when I say this? And so a lot of you guys are going to be listening to me and you're going to be like, oh, Cass, I'm doing really well. I'm good looking. I'm a good guy. Are you? Because if you are really as a good guy as what you say, your life would be, I would be, there would be loads of people who are talking about how much of a good guy you are, what you've done for people, the charities, how you've helped this person out, how you've backed this person right there would be review after review in your life of people who are telling everybody about you listen what i'm saying if you've got a product or you've got a, a business which is really really good it may be like a friend of mine who's got a mobile car cleaning valeting company so he goes basically around to people's homes and cleans their cars for them and uh, i was saying to him well if you think that you're so good they, you should have thousands of reviews. Loads of people should be reviewing you, shouting how amazing that you are. If you really are not that good, people aren't going to be shouting and raving about you. 
You may think you're doing a good job, but if people have an exceptional experience or service, they love talking about it. People love talking about when they have really shit experiences or their expectations are not met or when things go amazing for them, right? They want to recommend that everybody has the same experience. And so my question to you is, and, and it's really the emphasis of what I've been thinking about is, how do you, how are you actually doing? Like rate your life. You say you've got money. Okay, well, out of 10, based on what you could achieve and what you're achieving now, whereabouts are you on that? Okay, you say that you're uh, that in the dating market, you are the you you are above average. Okay, well, all right then. Well, let's see number one how the dating market determines men. So looks out of ten, we're talking about David. Uh, I don't know, Eldris Ilba being ten and somebody being zero. Somebody like from that guy from Elf, uh, the film Elf being zero. Whereabouts do you think that you rate out of that? Let right. You talk about your physical health. In the dating market, a woman, if there was two identical guys and one of them was had muscles and was fit and the other one was obese or overweight, she was always, almost always going to go for the one who is fit. So let's look at your physical health and your physical fitness. Are you saying that you're an 8 or 9 out of 10 in that? Because if you're not, what does that mean? What I'm trying to say to you is, if we start taking all of these different areas of your life which basically encompass how valuable you are, not only to yourself, but to the wider world around you. How important you are to your family, your community, your workplace, to your spouse. If we take all of these and we average the number out of 100, are we going to get like 80 and above? Or are we going to start getting really like 43, 44? And here's where it gets even more interesting. If other people rate you and they give your rating out of 100 in all of the different areas based on what they've seen about you, what would they rate you? Do you see what I'm saying when how deep this is getting? And what I'm trying to say to you is a lot of us have never actually thought about this stuff. We've never stopped. We've never examined ourselves. We've never actually rated ourselves. And when you start doing this stuff, you're like, damn. I am way behind as to where I should be. I thought by now I would be, there's a lot of you going to be listening to me, and by now you thought you would be married and you would have kids and you would have a three, four bedroom house. You are nowhere near that. And the question is, why? Because there's loads of people who are the same age as you who do have all of that. So why do you not have it? Now, this is where the separation in life happens because there are going to be some people who are going to hear me say that and they're going to say, well, Kasim, fuck the world, fuck people, fuck society, I don't care, the world is unjust, is, is unjust. women are shit, whatever. Is that productive? Does that help you become a winner? And this obviously now comes down to a sense of maturity because and, and a growth mindset and your mentality, like all of these things that you really encompass you. Because you, there's a lot of people who think, oh, Cassim, I have a great attitude. But the moment somebody betrays them, the moment things do not go their way, all of a sudden this great attitude that they've been talking about goes out of the window. So where is it? Right? There's a lot of women who think that they're great mothers, but the moment their partner cheats on them, all of a sudden, or they thought that they were great... If you're a great mother, irrelevant of whether your husband has cheated or not, you would still prioritize giving access to your to your to the father of your children, access to your children. Right? Because what does that mean? That means that just because a man has a bad relationship with you, it doesn't make him a bad father. There's a lot of women who when they split up with a man, they use a child to basically get revenge. And they're talking about how they're great mothers, they're great people. And actually, when you begin to really look at the data, you begin to really look at the fact sheets, it's like, whoa, this woman is not who she, he, she, she says she was. And I guess for you, really think about this in your own life. How are you rating? How are you actually doing, really? Not based on this hypothetical world that you're living in, but it, like, like in the, that's why I gave this as my the first set, 
the first exercise in my workshop because there's a lot of people when we do goal setting workshops who are living in delusion in denial they're like oh Kasim I'm not doing very bad financially hold on a minute you've just said you're in your overdraft you said you still have student debt you said at the moment you don't even earn the average of somebody who is uh, the same age as you in the UK, meaning if you are somebody who is in their 30s, the average income of somebody in their 30s is somewhere around 28,000 pounds to about 32,000 pounds. Meaning if you don't even earn that in your 30s, that means you're not even average, you're below average, right? And we're just talking about money because all of us can relate to money and we can we understand it and we can talk about it. But do you understand what I'm I'm saying when I start saying this stuff? And this is what I've been thinking about, and I've been really thinking about it for me, and I've been really thinking about examining myself and where am I? How am I doing? Like really looking at Cass, really, really stripping myself down, and really doing the work on myself is actually one of the. If I had more time, because it's up to an hour now, but if I had more time, this was the, the thing I want to talk to you about the, the, next, the second as, as a third or fourth thing or whatever it was, which is, have you done the work on you? If you are going in relationship or relationships are not working out for you, have you done the work? Have you actually gone to therapy? Have you actually gone and spoken to a counsellor? Right? Like, have you grieved? Have you forgiven? Like, a lot of people haven't done this work. And they talk about, and we talk about why the world is dysfunctional and there are people who are angry and people can't find spouses and there's a lot of single men who can't find partners and women are frustrated with men because they're not adequately successful or ambitious enough. These are all results and they're a consequence of all of us within the community operating under our potential in part because we don't do the work which is required. How can you get to the age of 30 and you've never once gone to a therapy session, a counseling session? Do you honestly, are you that arrogant that you think that you are that, that you've got your shit that well together? I don't know. Something for you to think about. So that's where I'm going to finish it. Um, I don't know. What did you think? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Have you had a similar experience? Like, what have you been reflecting on? What lessons have you learned this week? I want to know. I'm keen to hear your perspective. Um, don't, please, oh, before I forget, so I, I get told off again. If you like what I share today, guys, and you want to support me, please can you like and subscribe to my channel so that you can help me get to 1,000 subscribers by June. You'd be an absolute legend. Please, um... Yes, so that's where we, I'm going to leave it. But comment below. Um, and otherwise, I will see you next week. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I'll speak to you soon. Bye for now.